Sure. I was thinking that maybe I could uh, sit. Uh, it would be easier to, to do the live demoing uh, cool. later on and also less, less formal, mm -hmm. so if you don't mind. Uh, I, will, I will talk about my project called Funkis. Um, it's a bit more in the abstract rather than the previous um, systems that we have talked about. Uh, and it's concerned mainly with simplicity. And I will go into why I think simplicity is vital to what we are trying to accomplish. And the thing we are trying to accomplish is to answer why is coding difficult? What makes coding something that is only available to, to some? As it, why, why does it seem to be a high barrier to entry when it comes to writing code? Uh, and I think this arises mainly from the fact that there are two types of complexity when it comes to building a system. We have the essential complexity, which arrives from the pro problem itself, you can't, uh, which is inherent to the problem. But you also have the accidental complexity, which is not really inherent to the problem itself, but rather to the, the specific implementation of the solution or the complex tools that you use or bad design. And I think we need to try to eliminate this accidental complexity um, because it seems to be that that would uh, be a, a, a natural high barrier to entry when it comes to coding, if there's a lot of unneeded complexity. Uh, so how can we go about and, and try to remove that? Um, and then we come to simplicity, because simplicity is the opposite of complexity, and we need to f try to pin what simple really means. And I think, in terms of a framework, simple would mean to remove all the unnecessary features until you can't remove any, anything else. And those you have left, you need to generalize in, in such a way that they truly are the, the purest form of themselves. Uh, but it's important to point out that Simple isn't necessarily the same thing as easy. Uh, I would very much recommend that you check out this talk from Rick Hickey, the creator of uh, Clojure. Uh, it's really fantastic and really an eye-opener when it comes to the difference between simplicity and easy. Uh, and I think it's he highlights that best when he talks about the fact that simple means sort of like singular. It is the, the, it's a concept that has been boiled down to its essence and can't be reduced anymore. Whilst easy rather is something that's familiar uh, or close at hand. And the problem with easy is that it's in such a way subjective. It means a different thing to me it, than it does from everyone else. And perhaps that is the problem with coding, because maybe coding is easy for us, but difficult for everyone else. And then we have to see what are the things that are familiar and uh, close at hand to us, that they don't um, see the way we see it. And the, the thing I, I ended up with when I tried to find the, the least common denominator when it comes to coding and when it comes to building system is causality. 
I would say that every system there is can be described in terms of a, a causal event flow. It can be described in terms of what it actually accomplishes. Perhaps we have a web server which writes something to the database. Then that is the first step. And afterwards it does something else. And then it does something else. Uh, and given that this is the least common denominator, perhaps it would be a good way to start when we try to build the simplest possible way to describe this, these types of systems. Uh, so that is what, what fun Funkis tries to do, namely uh, serve as a tool to model this causality in a in the simplest possible way. And I'll try to describe how we, we do this. And in terms of uh, the way I've built it right now, it um, looks a lot like code. Um, it, I, I took the inspiration from JavaScripts and, and callbacks and lambdas from functional programming. But essentially what we are trying to do is to describe where something will, will happen, who will execute this function. We will define what will happen, which function should be executed. Uh, we need to define the input to this function and what output it produces. And we need to describe when the function will happen. Um, and the when part is actually very, very vital to all of this because you could make a range of different solutions to solve the when part. You can have a scheduler or, or a event queue or uh, whatever. You can deal with when very difficulty. Uh, I try to, to do it again in the simplest way, which would be that everything happens after the previous thing. And it's simply a matter of chaining functions together in this sense. Um, and of course you could have a function triggering two functions or several functions and in this sense you can branch out this flow of events um, and then we need to consider what will happen when uh, the function is triggered and it's very nice to think of them as pure functions a, a function where the same input always produces the same output, which is very nice, and it also doesn't cause any side effects. So that would make it very simple to test and simple to reuse, and we can combine um, all, all of these functions in a deterministic way. They would always produce the same result. But the problem is that side effects perhaps should be named simply effects. Because without these side effects, it would be ir irrelevant. And it would be irrelevant in the same way that it is irrelevant to compute one plus one without storing it in a variable or printing it to the output. Because who would know that the computation had actually occurred if you don't have any effects of it? So side effects are immensely important to coding and building these systems. And they are also very complex because they can be thought of in a number of different ways. I mean, for instance, we have the very common scenario where we print something to the output in, in the, when we have a command line tool. Uh, 
but we have also more difficult side effects to consider. For instance, when you send out a mail to somebody, the side effect could be that somebody reads this, this mail and gets very angry because it's a bad message. Um, so what I'm trying to get at, I think, is that the side effects are an essential complexity when it comes to programming. And we need to find a, a good way to, to handle it. Uh, the problem is, it's messy. It can't be handled in a generalized way that fits all solutions. So what Funkis does is that it it leaves this bit to the, to the user. The user has to know what side effects all of it, the components in the event flow produces. Um, that is the difficult part of programming. But I think it's the essential difficulty in programming, which is you can't take it away without losing anything. We talked earlier about how visual programming actually limits the possible systems that we can build. And my approach when I put Funkis together is to think up a system which doesn't have any limits, that doesn't even have any limits in terms of that it has to be a computer that um, executes the, the events. Perhaps it's a human being that executes the, the, each step in this chain. That is, that is not written in stone. Um, so what Funkis is, it's a separation between what happens, when it happens, from how it happens. Because how it happens can be uh, can be implemented in a number of different ways. You could write a program that does the same thing in a range of different ways. So we leave that out of the picture. Uh, we're left with a good system for building distributed systems. Uh, since, it's, since the event flow is purely chronological, it is also stateless in the sense that you can stop executing at each step in the chain and resume execution whenever you want. Uh, meaning that you can shut off the system and fire it up one year later and continue from where you were. And that, it turns out, is very useful when you're building a distributed system because you don't have to um, keep a reference to the, the whole uh, system on one piece of machine. Each node only has to finish off its event. And when it's done, it's done and uh, leaves it off to, to the rest of the flow. Uh, and in this sense, I feel that Funk is, is a good match between functional programming and flow-based programming because uh, functional programming loves the idea of a pure function. But as we said earlier, a pure function is perhaps irrelevant without any side effects. And I'm saying that maybe Funkis is, is the way to connect these pure functions and functional programming in a way that makes it uh, more compatible with the systems that we actually want to build. Um, so yeah, um, we'll try to, to demo this, uh, this uh, thing and uh, we'll see what happens. And in the meantime, feel free to ask uh, any questions. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about where does the fun if you have a flow based uh, graph or network where does the functional come in yeah is it 
interacting with the network or is it confined within the component? It's actually within the black box part of it. Right. Uh, I mean, when you're combining black boxes together, it would be nice if they are all pure in the sense yeah, that they absolutely. don't cause any side effects. Uh, but the, pr the the language itself isn't really uh, functional in that sense. The, the, which language? <coughs> the, uh, the the scripting language. Uh, I will I will show it. Um, the language that is used to describe this event flow. Mm. And it looks like this. Um, I'll see if I can perhaps make it bigger. Is it difficult to see? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you can zoom in on the back with, with control key and control. Control and scroll. scroll. Yeah. Scroll. Two, two, two fingers on the, on oh, the touch okay. card? May, maybe it doesn't work very, very well with Wim. Uh, no, it zooms in the entire, the entire uh, operating system. Oh, yeah. control? Yeah, control key and, and, and scrolling on the touchpad. Like two fingers or something up, up and down. It doesn't seem to work very well. You have, maybe you enable it in a second. Uh, or is anyone familiar with Vim, the editor? No, of course. Yeah? Loki is written in Tottenham Vim. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe you know how to make the type bigger? Isn't it on Mac Vim settings? Uh, no, I only use terminal Vim. After <laughs> <laughs> Mac Vim? Mac Vim. Preferences? Graphics uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But the preferences to configure this zoom screen thing. Yeah, in the setting, system preferences. Font size. It's, um, I did this yesterday. Oh. <laughs> because yeah. I didn't know how to do it. Yeah, I'm so quite new to it's the accessibility. Of the, the As accessibility. Yeah. I thought it was enabled by default. Yeah, and then use your keyboard. And Mac, everything just that works. Right. On the top. Control key. No, no, no it's just kind of fun kind of all right. Uh, Control and two two fingers on the on the. Oh, oh look at that! <laughs> uh, yeah. Nice. Oh, in it. Yeah, works. So it's, is it a little bit better? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, so what we have here is a simple event flow, where I will try to describe what each step does and it's a HTTP server which um, listens to connections and each time it gets a connection it fires and it fires with an ID and then it writes HTML to this connection uh, which um, uses the CSS selector to input new HTML in the, the client document. Uh, and then it binds a certain set of events to uh, any given HTML uh, selector. And each time this event fires, uh, we, in this case, compiles the, the value that we get um, and run it through a markdown compiler with, which uh, takes a, a, any given string as input and produces HTML as output and when that, when that is done we send more HTML to the client page and uh, this will hopefully look like this this is the text area that we listen for events, and we will be able to write a uh, markdown here. Uh, are you familiar with markdown syntax? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, and yeah, you can write whatever. Um, so let's say that we want to do something else. Maybe we would like to have a clock on our, uh, on our site. Um, then we would like to, uh, in this case, I've uh, set up a couple of uh, components, which the first one uh, uses an interval and fires continuously after this interval. And we can call it uh, like this. Does the indentation have any meaning or is it just for... In the, yeah. Indentation is, in this uh, case, very important because it signifies uh, how the branching works. Uh, after the on connections, then you, you can, if you use this line of level of indentation, uh, they are... Kind of multiple. Yeah, they are split mm. and they are executed in parallel, mm. whilst if you use uh, more indentation, it's uh, synchronously. Mm. Um, but I mean, this is merely a, a representation of how you could define this event flow. I mean, you could just as well do a visual representation with a, a flow chart where you uh, write the, the function names or have predefined components and and as such. Right. It, w it would be the same thing. Uh, we need to define uh, how long interval and it's in milliseconds and uh, we need to figure out what time it is. So I have a time function. Uh, it doesn't take any parameters but it outputs hours, minutes and seconds. And then we will and we need to output this to something on the page. But we don't have any, any clock on our page, so we need to add that. And in this case, I have a bit... Oh, <laughs> uh, this is awkward. So I've made this bit a nice clock, and as we can see here, uh, this is Yade syntax, by the way, which is compiled into HTML. But this will be an element in the document with the ID hours, and this will be an element with the ID minutes, and so on. So we can call them here in our script uh, seconds and we want to use the S bit <coughs> and to the ID of the client. And then add the minutes and the hours. So, and hopefully it will use a clock or not. I just want to see what goes on. Since we coded out in the the, no. the, the HTML code for the, for the clock, seems to be coded out. If you go back to the browser. Ah, right. Yes. So we haven't we haven't uh, saved it properly. Ah, oh, there it is. Uh, now it should be. Oh, we 
forgot to save this bit as well. Oh, there we are. Nice. It's running. Nice. Uh, so it's a really trivial example of what you can do, and it doesn't exemplify the distributed bit of it, uh, but in essence, you can do whatever you like for each step here. Each step in the uh, order of events is, you can do whatever. And I think maybe that is a, a good way to look at programming, not in the sense of building a programming language with a, which is based upon the limitations of a computer, because we can essentially do whatever we like with the computer, it's only difficult. The difficult, the really difficult part is imagination and figuring out what you want your system to do. And then I think um, this limitlessness is important. So I, I guess that's it for, for, for me. Uh, do, do you have to, um, now it seems like you have a complete language for, for manipulating a web, web page and yeah. do, do you have to use it like that or could you use it as a sort of wrapper layer which calls code written in other, lang other languages? Definitely. I, I've, I've written this framework to, to work with Node.js. Okay. But I also have a, a halfway done implementation in C Sharp, mm. and uh, they work interchangeably. Mm. So you can have a function in Node.js and then a function in C Sharp, okay. uh, and then you can do whatever you like. If mm. you just the execution is in concurrent and so on. Yeah, it's not not right. It's not like the. The in, it's not like an interpreter going over the code and so on. You can you can think of it in terms of um, before each each line here is executed, you you figure out a, a pointer to this script because this script represents a, a tree of events. So this is the first event and this is the first event of the first event. And in this sense you get a, a unique ID which identifies uh, which event is to be executed. Which means that uh, you can keep the execution going offline, as I said earlier. I, I'm trying to figure out how I'm especially interested in this, how it uh, works together with the flow-based concept there. Yeah. And uh, could, could you say that it, it's uh, one way to, you can kind of stay in the same environment both while you're writing your components and while you're writing the, con the data flow. You use this language for the both. Because I've seen that in the flow-based community people suggest yeah. to to, for example, functional programming to implement the components, yeah. just because it's, it has its benefits. Even though from the flow-based perspective it doesn't matter that much, yeah. if, it just, if you can be sure that the component works. But here it seems like you, you span both the, the graph drawing and the, the writing of the components in the same environment. Pardon. Not necessarily, because writing this, um, writing the, the flow mm. is completely separated from writing the component. Okay, okay. But you have, you cover both, <coughs> you could say, it, but you cover both. Uh, 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 but but uh, how would you contrast it to, towards, uh, towards other ways of flow-based programming where you just implement things? I, I would say the biggest difference is that Funkus isn't concerned about what happens in the component. Mm. It's a complete black box. Mm. Funkus is simply a protocol for 
passing along the torch along this um, event flow. Uh, so I mean, anything can happen in between the steps. When when this HTML function is called. Uh, so you see it more as a, as a graph layer rather than implementing the, the method. Yeah, I, I think a very nice way of thinking about it is having a, a big language mm -hmm. and a small language, where the small language deals with how the function call is handled on the computer, and the big language is used to describe the big picture. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm trying to contrast it to, for example, different ways of defining a graph declaratively, yeah. like inputs and outputs and so yeah. on. But could you say that you, you're in a way a bit more declarative than, than even a, a defining a graph? Because when you define a graph, then you kind of wire things. Yeah, input, and, output. and that's a, a very important... Th that's kind of a technical layer, and it seems no, like... But it, as it, it's, it's quite important, and it's a, an important distinction between the two, because in the other, in your flow-based approaches, you have the idea of, a, of an object, of one component, which lives in a sense, mm -hmm. which can be connected to, which means that you can also connect the output to its import, input and have a uh, loop. loop. Uh, that is not possible in Funkis because it's, it's a flow of, of time. It wouldn't make sense to connect an event in the future with an event in the past mm -hmm. because it's the past. Yeah. Uh, so each step here, each black box, isn't a, an object. It isn't an instance of the function, mm -hmm. uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's, I think it's in that sense a bit that I mean that you're more declarative. You work more on the level of how you're thinking the yeah. execution of the program while these graph de definitions are a bit more technical. It's more like yeah. you have to imagine how the execution will go in the network while you're more yeah. outlining it in, in the... Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. And it, along with that bit, uh, it follows a range of interesting um, uh, concerns when it comes to uh, the lifetime of the components. Mm. Because if they have an internal memory, what happens if this uh, internal memory is full? Or what happens if it has a state and that state is corrupted? Uh, which could lead to lead to a lot of difficult di difficult problems, which is why I didn't go with an um, object approach when it comes to it. And it's maybe maybe it's in that sense that Funk is, is more functional rather than objective, whilst your approaches are objective rather than functional. I think I can see. Some something of that. Yeah. At least. <laughs> okay. So so how do you build very large programs in this I mean this is a fairly small example. Yeah. If it would be huge uh, you can say that this script uh, I mean you could write a very long script if yeah. you wanted to. Uh, but that isn't the big part. The big part is you have a lot of nodes. And the script serves as a contract of sorts. And this contract is used to make sure that every node in the system is talking the same event flow. Uh, so if we have a, a set of nodes and each node uh, have the same script, then they can figure out <coughs> when it's my turn to, to uh, execute a function. That is actually where this first bit comes into play. Uh, it's a description of which node will execute this function. 
in this case, it's the data node that executes the interval function. And the UI node executes the HTML function. And they might not live on the same machine. How do you, in this example, you sort of structure it like an um, upside down tree, right? Start with one, yeah. one connection, yeah. branches out. Can you, can you make branches few, few uh, back into the That is the interesting thing, because okay. um, joining uh, a branching is very, very complex. Yeah. Because if they are completely parallel, mm. uh, then you have an, then it's an ambiguous which one comes first. Yeah. So if you join these two together, maybe it's important to figure out which one comes first. Uh, and that would be, uh, that would affect the output. Mm. Uh, and in the same sense, since it doesn't have um, the, the concept of one uh, one signal as blocky does, uh, it could be that if you have a branching out, then you could end up with uh, two signals from different uh, contexts mm -hmm. that that has ended up in in the wrong order. Right. I mean, if you you if you make an HTTP request twice, and each uh, HTTP request is splitted and later then joined, then perhaps um, the two different requests end up in the uh, same join. Okay. And that would be a big problem. So, 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 you, so can, it can be done in, in this structure? You mean, it or? can absolutely be done, but then you have to handle the side effects mm -hmm. because then you would have a event that saves the the data mm -hmm. and stores it for for later when the another function ends up with the second part of the data mm -hmm. and stores it and realizes that both bits are here <coughs> so now we can continue yeah so the join have to has to be implemented by the programmer, okay, because it's a complexity. Mm. Have you been thinking of making this graphical, visual? Absolutely. I, I, I uh, when I thought this up, I had a visual representation in mind. I mean, in my head. This is as visual as anything else, uh, because text is also a, a, a picture, or can be thought of as a picture. Uh, and it would be trivial to transform this information into a flow chart. And as long as you always go down and don't join or loop, then it would be trivial to transform it back into script form. Mm. But I didn't do a visual representation of it because I'm not a visual guy. <laughs> I'm not a designer, or at least not a very good one. Maybe someone should make a general visual kind of library that can be yeah. used for it. Mm. Or maybe there is one. You can steal no flows art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how active are you in this right now? I actually some, quit others? my job last fall, about this time, and uh, spent close to a year working full time on my own pay for, for this uh, project. Uh, I mean, the financial returns were non-existent, uh -huh. so I had to find a new job. <laughs> Uh, and I'm very excited to, to be here and talk about this because as I listen to you guys talk, I realize that it actually is very close to uh, what you are, are doing. And uh, I'm very curious to, to 
here, whether you think it makes sense or it uh, is uh, completely, uh, I don't know, crazy or, or so. so. I guess it's, it seems like, for, for me personally, I, I, it seems like one needs more to work, work on it and practice a lot to, to see the yeah. corner cases. It's, uh, I think it's it's really interesting to see all these concepts, but it's, it's hard for I think it's very hard to see how far you can go with these different mm. how they will turn out. I, I would like to see something uh, maybe a more complex example that show shows what, what can be done in Funkus that maybe is impossible or very hard in, in other with other approaches. Yeah. I think that would help. I I think yeah. The problem with that is actually uh, it's hard to make an example because you're doing an actual problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is trivial in almost any language, uh, but making an example which showcases how Funkus can be used to describe the complexity of an actual problem, you have to have an actual pro problem that is difficult to to figure out. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, when I've thought about it, I've, ha I've considered like the infrastructure that powers the Twitter feed mm -hmm. and it's, it's huge scale and how Funkis could be used to describe the steps needed to figure out the events yeah. that takes place. Yeah. And maybe that would be a Good yeah. example. Yeah. How how easy would it be to to use it, for example, for stream processing or like say, yeah, I am thinking of bioinformatics where you have lots of stream processing, often in file formats that are line based. So you um, want to do kind of. It's only ever as difficult as as it would be to to write it in a, a regular programming language, because you can. You can hide it away in one line. Yeah, because it seems like it's kind of it's kind of a natural extension from Unix pipes, for example. But it's yes. more declarative and, and readable and so on. So yes, that is the the inspiration. Yeah. So if you, I mean, if you can keep it in that very so you so that you can write it very tersely. Yeah. Then I think it could be very attractive for that if you have a good kind yeah. of backend that is sufficient to explain. Yeah. It. Maybe you could describe a simple but important problem that maybe Pat, Pat can yeah, <laughs> I help uh, solving with this. Yeah. yeah, that would be very interesting. Yeah, I think, and I'm also I'm seeing it quite like a, a challenge to those I introduced this thing to to come up with something which breaks my model, mm. uh, which which would prove that uh, this least common denominator isn't actually the the single singular bit in all of this and and finding a system which uh, which is different or mm. yeah. yeah i would find it interesting to 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 hear yeah kind of contrast it look like you have john paul morrison look at it or mm -hmm. something. because because he worked on on the flow based concept so long so mm. he yeah, and in practice, I mean, he's still quite. I mean, because of new technology and so on, not everything's written in stone. So he's mm. kind of discussing and open to ideas and so on. Mm. Yeah. Also, yeah. I, I, I really like that this uh, event sort of has this concept of events. Yes. Yeah. Because we looked at the caller graph you showed. Mm. So, so if you try to model the system by connecting every possible thing that can happen together, it gets messy. Mm -hmm. but, but if you model it with modular events, it becomes much more yeah. uh, easy to, to uh, comprehend and understand what happens. So this comic strip stuff I, I did, which I handed out to you, that's based on each comic strip is an event. So mm -hmm. there are only two panels in every strip. So the first panel is the condition, and when it looks like that on the play yeah. field, the thing in the second strip will happen. Um, so, yeah, so, so, <laughs> I 
Yeah, yeah. Just us. I don't know what I'm saying. That is, <laughs> that is, that is perhaps... You, you made a very good introduction. I mean, very well thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that is what is interesting here because thanks to its simplicity, because it is simple yeah. as it only has like four roots. Yeah. And really one is only important. And that is, everything happens after the previous part. And uh, then you have <coughs> data and have you, uh, how you handle the input to output. But that is really to make it more simple to use. Yeah. And, and connecting events with functional programming is a very nice thing. I, I, I never seen it like this explained or, or described like this before. Mm. And you even said that. You know, because when I thought, thought about functional programming, you, you, you call the functions, I mean, so... Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, but but uh, the functions can, of course, be asynchronously executed or in parallel, or yeah. as you say, a different machine. You even said, I think a human could do something with it. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and like, one year later, it yeah, <laughs> continues to run. We so I really have. like that event function. Yeah, we should definitely not limit ourselves to only do computer programming. Because what if we end up with a function which is so more efficient to do in a, in a human brain yeah. rather than a computer? Yeah. Isn't it relevant to do it in a, com in a human rather than a computer then? I, I think then... It seems like s some of these things that you take up, it's also applicable to flow-based programming, I think. So there's a bit of an overlap here, I think. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I will. It will be interesting to figure out how how this goes together. And I, I'm, I'm thinking of. I'm just guessing that maybe it will be interesting to be able to kind of use both concepts in, in together somehow. Sure. And I, I guess that's one of, of the benefits of the model as well. I mean, you can, yeah. it's inputs and outputs, so you can kind of mix and match, match yeah. as much as you want. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's, uh, it seems that this, for example, this uh, branching model that maybe you will run into some limitations somewhere. Although I cannot the, tell the limitation that. is probably that it's difficult. Uh, you can you can think of it in terms of when you construct an algorithm and try to make it parallel, then you end up with problems if you have to to lock somewhere in the algorithm. You have to wait for a resource. Uh, the branching that I suggest in fun funk is, is really like a lock-free algorithm. Mm. It just finishes. Yeah. And it's very <coughs> difficult to um, come up with this kind of solution for every pro problem. Yeah. So that is what, what is really difficult about Funkis. But th th that's also where I think it, uh, it's really nice in one way. So, so, but but it seems like maybe using both, both concepts together yeah. can can be very powerful in, in real life. That's, Absolutely. That, that's just a intuition, but I, I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah.